Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you all, um, especially Nayash, for the opportunity and invitation to speak today. Um, I um, am under the direction of Dr. Crane, who's sitting to my right, and Dr. Lucchini, who's up on the panel now, um, and I'm with the Mount Sinai Responder Program. I'm going to do my best to follow Dr. Reidman um, uh, and speak briefly about um, where we are with regards to lower airways disease. Um, I do not intend to go over every publication that's been um, published to date regarding lower airway disease, because that would be an entire day, um, but really just touch upon how we got to where we are today and um, the pattern that kind of brought us here. So there's certainly been a number of studies through the World Trade Center program evaluating lung conditions and those exposed. Um, and all of these have contributed in some way, shape, or form to what we know about lung disease in our responders and survivors today. Keyword is all, and I'd like to pivot off of what Dr. Howard said in terms of re re needing more than one study to, to show um, evidence that uh, there's disease in this population, and uh, we've been fortunate enough to work very closely with our colleagues, both at the survivor program and with FDNY, um, to work together in research and um, show that certain diseases are cropping up in all of our cohorts. Um, so currently, the World Trade Center program covers several lung conditions, asthma, COPD, sarcoidosis, interstitial lung disease, um, and we'll certainly be talking more about these later today. Um, however, the history behind how these conditions came to be covered conditions really should not be ignored. Um, it certainly gives us perspective as to what has been done to date, and it really sets the stage for considering how we're going to move forward. So in taking a step back um, and uh, reflecting on what Dr. Reibman said earlier, um, early on um, with exposure, we were seeing immediate symptoms, both upper and lower airway, specific to lower airway. As Dr. Reibman mentioned, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, tightness in the chest. And certainly, it was at this point when physicians were seeing these symptoms, um, it was like a red flag. Um, so thinking about the research around that time, it was very symptom driven. And in 2004, there was a group of physicians that banded together looking at about 96 iron workers that worked at the site between September 11th and February, and, and February of 2002. Um, and it really had pretty big impact because it, it showed that 77% of the patients were complaining of respiratory symptoms with cough being the most common. Um, in addition, there was the five-year study that was put out um, and published by Dr. Moline, Dr. Herbert, and Dr. Levin um, that similarly found elevated respiratory symptoms and abnorm abnormal breathing studies. Um, most of you are familiar with those tests that we do on a year-to-year -year basis to evaluate lung function, as Dr. Ryman described. So those objective tests became very important because they justified um, that what we were seeing from a symptom perspective could be acknowledged in, in a data way. Um, so in the study that Dr. Moline published with Dr. Herbert, uh, we picked up that force vital capacity, which is a, a number that we look at on the breathing test, was noted to be abnormal in 24% of our patients. Force vital capacity is, an, is basically representative of when a patient takes a deep breath in, it assesses how well they're able to blow all that air out. And 24% of our patients were showing an abnormal value. So why was this important? Well, one, we had that objective data point along with symptoms. And two, it realized, you, you know what? Um, these symptoms shouldn't be ignored, and we really need to monitor these folks for long-term uh, surveillance purposes to see if, they're, if these numbers continue to decline stabilized, or if there are any other conditions that may be associated with these abnormal parameters. So in addition to the breathing test, we started to look, obviously, at chest x-ray, CAT scan, and evaluate the impact of, of what we were seeing in our patients with regards to those imaging studies. And in 2007, Dr. De La Hose and his colleagues looked at CAT scans um, in, our, in our responders and found that um, we were seeing some abnormalities in the airways that are much deeper in the lungs. So it was at that point in time when we realized, well, you know, certainly 
diseases more in the upper area, like asthma, bronchitis, and cough were of concern because that was immediate and acute exposure. But then long-term effects, was that going to have effect deeper down in the lungs and the lung tissue? Um, and we realized shortly after, with the research that the fire department put out, um, that there was a disease called sarcoidosis, which uh, shows that the lungs can get inflamed and have enlarged lymph nodes, was um, cropping up in the cohort. And it was around 2006 when we had a federally funded program for a treatment program. And it was at that point in time when we were categorizing diseases and figuring out which diseases could be covered. And we had asthma, bronchitis, chronic cough, and COPD. But with the literature that Mount Sinai put out and the literature that the fire department put out actually before us, um, we were able to say, you know what, sarcoidosis is probably one of those conditions we should we should put on the list. Uh, shortly after, there was a publication by Dr. Moline and some pathologists. Um, it was um, identifying that interstitial lung disease, which is a scarring of the lungs that can happen, um, was noted to be found in seven of prior healthy patients. Um, that was concerning. We flagged it, and um, it was considered a cover condition. So. Um, this just goes to show you that as time has progressed, the thought process behind research has evolved. So it starts out with symptoms, and then objective testing, and then we categorize the disease. And then moving forward, we've come to understand that comorbid World Trade Center disease plays a role as well. And it was in 2011 when Dr. Wisniewski looked at uh, our 27,000 responders and identified that we were seeing elevated cumulative incidence of asthma, sinusitis, GERD, kind of looking at the population of a whole in terms of all the different types of diseases that we were seeing and how it was impacting respiratory, upper, lower, GI, and mental health. So this kind of brings us where we are now with research. So we've, we have symptoms, objective findings, disease recognition, and now it led to evolution of care in terms of inclusion of lower airway disease and interaction of these conditions and comorbidities and understanding the progression and how some of these diseases may stabilize or progress and how we can best manage and treat. Currently, Dr. Wisniewski uh, is working at Mount Sinai on um, looking and assessing inflammatory and behavioral pathways linked to PTSD and increased asthma morbidity. Prior to that, he assessed uh, how we can best monitor patients with asthma in our World Trade Center population and determine the best course of treatment and management interventions. Dr. De La Hose, who's here today, will be speaking about his study regarding pulmonary disease and CAT scan and how it correlates to respiratory symptoms in our responders, breathing tests, and their occupational exposure. So to attempt to sum up the importance of the program, in a few lines would not really do it justice. But what we can say, it's important to note that the World Trade Center program works to provide excellence in care for all of our patients to learn from our responders, survivors, and volunteers by studying World Trade Center cover conditions and how we can better monitor and treat these conditions. And certainly to use the lessons learned to maybe even understand areas of disease that may remain a bit of a mystery and are less understood in clinical medicine to date. So with that, we and I extend a special thank you to all of the responders, survivors, and all of our partners at Labor, and certainly, of course, Dr. Howard and Nyash. Thank you very much, and looking forward to an exciting day.